And we're very happy to have our own uh, Professor Piscujo here tonight to speak with us. Professor Piscujo finished his PhD at Chicago with a dual degree in anthropology and East Asian languages and civilizations uh, in 2000. Uh, he then went back to his native Sweden where he uh, was the director of the Museum of Far Eastern Antiquities in Stockholm for uh, a couple of years. Five years, yeah. Five years. Uh, this is a very uh, famous uh, museum. He then went uh, to uh, uh, the Institute for Advanced Study, which is in Princeton, uh, not at Princeton, I think that's technically the right way to say that, uh, where Cornell then quickly nabbed him up and brought him here in 05, 2005. That's right. Uh, where he's you been know. teaching ever since. So, uh, Professor Piscujo <laughs> speaks, studies on a broad range of issues. He's a member of the East Asia and the Southeast Asia program. He studies, uh, among other things, the Wa minority uh, who straddle China and Burma, uh, has worked on human trafficking, uh, and uh, has worked in fields as old as mine, the ancient, most ancient historical dynasties, and as contemporary as now. Uh, and I think now is what we're hearing about tonight. So I will leave the rest of the time to him to talk to us about TV Tears Made of Fear. Joining me, welcome. Thank you. All right, thank you for that introduction, Robin. Um, well, without further ado, the spectacles of forced and televised confessions that we have been seeing on Chinese TV over the last few years are part of a wider picture in China of the government's communist government silencing alternative and dissident voices by censorship, intimidation, disappearances, arrests, and the trumped up judicial punishment inflicted on dissident and others. Uh, we should acknowledge that this trend, uh, this new trend, is not wholly unique to China, but sadly fits with an ongoing worldwide authoritarian turn. We are witnessing how in many countries around the world, just as at similar turns in history in the past, authoritarian strongmen are either taking power by force or where elections exist, getting themselves elected with the help of voters who are apathetic or frustrated with democracy and longing for what seems simpler, a strongman. We note how today's authoritarians share many things. They congratulate each other on their efficiency in getting things done and in telling it as it is. As they reject democracy and dispense with democracy, they share especially in contempt for the freedom of expression and equality before the law, without which, of course, there can be no democracy. And they seek to censor and to guide public opinion in these directions. Uh, authoritarian China uh, currently seems ahead of all the other authoritarians in curbing and managing public opinion especially now that they are successfully harnessing the new digital universe of technologies to do this ever more eff effectively. The forced and the televised confessions in China are closely related to a key element in this authoritarian term, and that is to go beyond the mere silencing or censoring of alternative voices and opinions and seek to determine the facts, to shape reality so that it conforms to state orthodoxy, to the preordained teleology or set course of history which I will get back to later. Yes, I will begin by talking about the Causeway Bay bookstore where uh, five booksellers were uh, taken away, abducted, um, starting October 2015. One of them taken from Thailand, where he was vacationing, three from China, where they were visiting, and one from inside of Hong Kong. This is one of the many so-called second floor, this was, uh, one of the so-called second floor bookstores uh, in Hong Kong that sell books on Chinese politics that are forbidden in China, but are very much sought after by Chinese customers who are visiting from the mainland. And you can see the sign for it there on the second floor. Uh, the first uh, person to be uh, abducted, uh, that is from Thailand, is an old friend of mine. Uh, that I have known since the 1980s. His name is Gui Minhai, or Ahai is the nickname that I usually know him by. He uh, was abducted in October, as I mentioned, and then uh, disappeared from Thailand. He left behind um, 
unused medicine lined up on the, on the table and so on. In an empty apartment, uh, his computer still on and so on. And he was apparently then taken through Cambodia and flown back to China where he was held in detention, incommunicado, and without any uh, news to family or friends or anything. Until suddenly on January 17, 2016, he was put on Chinese state TV confessing to certain crimes that had happened more than a decade earlier and which seemed to have been resolved at the time but now had been dug up again uh, and now were being used against him. I have to tell you that it was very painful. Uh, I still have trouble watching this uh, video that they put on show because they know the person uh, who is there. Uh, this is him, the way he looked in the 1980s when I first met him and when he went to Sweden to study. This is where he changed from his Chinese citizenship to uh, Swedish citizenship. So he's a compatriot of mine, which uh, makes this issue especially fraught because he's being held and uh, denied access to the, uh, his embassy, the Swedish embassy. This is the picture of him recently having put on some weight uh, and um, uh, in his new life as a writer and publisher in Hong Kong, where I last saw him uh, at a dinner there in uh, 2012. We had not kept close touch uh, over the years, but uh, uh, I have been following the news ever since this happened. The British newspaper, The Guardian, have done a, a lot of good journalistic work following up on this, such as going to his vacation apartment, checking on those pills on the table, and so on and so forth. And this is their page, their page uh, graphic of illustrating the sequence in which these uh, disappearances happened. And uh, it uh, uh, was first unknown to the world that these uh, disappearances were happening. Um, and it blew up uh, uh, first in November when the news came out, but especially since uh, the last days of December 2015 when uh, uh, the last one, the fifth one of these collaborators, uh, associates, colleagues, w apparently was taken from within Hong Kong, which caused an enormous stir because, as you know, there's a, a promise from China to respect the judicial autonomy of Hong Kong until 2047. And this would be a flagrant breach of that. So it became uh, much more of a news uh, than before. This is uh, Li Bo, the gentleman who caused uh, this to become uh, so much bigger in the news. And these are the, the four other um, booksellers as each of them uh, turned up uh, in their professional videos shown on uh, Chinese state television. This, uh, this series of events, uh, especially then starting January 2016, uh, caused, um, pro provoked a lot of protest in Hong Kong because of the worry about the future of Hong Kong. And <clears throat> here you see people uh, holding posters and uh, demanding the release uh, of these people involved. Uh, some form of uh, protest also continued by trying to continue to, to sell the kinds of books that these uh, bookstores were uh, selling before. Uh, book, this bookstore, Causeway Bay, is not the only one, but the one of several that did this. And of course, these protests also connected up with a much larger um, movement in Hong Kong of suspicion of China's motives in perhaps scrapping the uh, one country, two systems deal with the freedom of expression and uh, judicial autonomy for Hong Kong. Uh, so such that uh, uh, even some of the Hong Kong dissidents uh, became surprised that their uh, efforts caught such enormous attention around the world, uh, which is what happened with Agnes Ting. Uh, Hong Kong's chief executive, which is, uh, who is appointed from um, uh, China, uh, was in a fix because he operates under a mini constitution that says very clearly that uh, there is freedom of speech, freedom of, spe of the press, freedom of publication in Hong Kong, and no Hong Kong resident shall be subjected to arbitrary or unlawful arrest, detention, or imprisonment. Uh, so he came out and said um, that if it were true indeed that 
one of these booksellers were taken from inside Hong Kong, that would not be acceptable. And he also expressed the worry about the, the others. Uh, the protests that continued uh, uh, sometimes turned to uh, humor. And uh, uh, when the Chinese authorities on the mainland produced messages from those abducted saying that they were OK, uh, that uh, there was no case, that they were not disappeared, that they were not kidnapped, um, the uh, people in Hong Kong used this uh, to produce uh, mock statements from a supposedly kidnapped uh, Hong Kong governor, <laughs> the chief executive of Hong Kong, uh, writing to his wife and saying, uh, I'm, not, I'm fine. Uh, I'm getting the, my favorite tea. Uh, my abductors are really nice to me. The special committee uh, in charge of my case are being really nice to me. So this is a kind of a, a protest that is possible in Hong Kong, a satire a mocking this kind of uh, attempt from uh, within uh, China, from the Chinese authorities to coerce uh, these people that had been abducted and taken away to produce such statements that people could not believe were uh, real. In Sweden at the same time, uh, mass media uh, has been following this case very closely because this is a Swedish citizen that uh, has been detained since October uh, under very unclear circumstances how he was abducted from Thailand. So our government has made communications with the Thai government as well as with the Chinese government and demanded to see him and demanded that uh, he's given uh, due process under the law. But he's been, uh, um, he's been denied uh, access to the embassy except for twice uh, that he's met uh, embassy officers from um, our country. Uh, he has a daughter who is a university student currently doing an MA uh, at a university in um, England, though she grew up in Sweden and speaks uh, completely idiomatic Swedish. She is Swedish just like me. Uh, she has become a campaigner on behalf of her uh, father. And uh, for a while she was silent, but, uh, and she was very frightened by this, uh, this situation where she was getting contacts from her father, which were clearly also under duress, where he would not say where he was, he would not spell out uh, the circumstances uh, under which he were, was held. He would only be limiting himself to, to very brief messages of concern. Clearly as he, there was a policeman sitting next to him while he was talking to his daughter. Now, one of his colleagues uh, is uh, Lan Wing Ki, uh, who is both a writer of political books and the store manager of this uh, bookstore. He was detained inside China when he was visiting there. Uh, he was taken on a train blindfolded to Ningbo, uh, another part of China. And there he was uh, imprisoned in isolation for a lengthy time, uh, and during which the uh, uh, people held him um, they also uh, forced him to practice a statement, a confession, which he would read. Uh, and <clears throat> this he did on February uh, 28, 2016, along with several other uh, colleagues. And this also involved accusing his uh, former colleague, Gui Minhai, of being the ringleader that the blame should be put on. Well, so far, uh, this is playing out in a very sad way. Then came a high point. Uh, there were these three other colleagues, uh, Gui Minhai is still held, three other colleagues have been, uh, have been allowed to return to Hong Kong. They have come out insisting they were not abducted, there's no case, there's nothing to talk about, and they've been silent. But Lam Wing Ki, he came back apparently on orders to retrieve a customer database to provide that to the Chinese authorities so that they could trace every customer of the bookstore. And uh, instead he decided According to him, on the, uh, uh, it was a decision he made after arriving in Hong Kong. I will not go back. And instead, he sought out local politicians and arranged a press conference at which he told all about his ordeal, how this was done to him, the way he was blindfolded, the way he was put on a train, the way they talked to him, everything they did to him, and how this confession was manufactured and forced onto him uh, under threat, under, under intimidation. And uh, this uh, was the first time that the international community could hear an uncoerced uh, message, a testimony from one of these abducted people, not under the control of uh, uh, 
uh, the authorities in China. And uh, that's been written up. He wrote that up after that in, very, in a very detailed fashion. And it's one of the strongest testimonies that we have anywhere of how this is done, how this kind of confession is produced, uh, the steps that the, the authorities that do this take when they do it. And that's available now uh, at, uh, online at places like the Hong Kong Free Press. He then took part in uh, protests openly in Hong Kong, uh, speaking against these abductions and uh, for the freedom of the press and so on, along with other people in Hong Kong. And then came a low point, uh, which was then when the authorities in China that had done this to him sent out a, a, a statement that uh, he would face the worst consequences if he didn't come back right away, which uh, in, made him say, I'm probably moving to Taiwan, because if Hong Kong is not safe, uh, I will seek safety elsewhere. So we can ask, why is this happening? And that question can be broken down into multiple questions. You can say, uh, why the crackdown on Hong Kong bookstores? And why start with this bookstore? There are others. Why were they singled out? And of course, the broader question that I want to get to after trying to answer those first ones, how is this related to the wider crackdown in China on the expression of alternative views since uh, the last few years? Uh, some possible answers are that there are top government and Communist Party leaders who have a very thin skin. They want to cultivate an air of infallibility. They could do nothing wrong. And so the stuff that's in those Hong Kong published books that accuse them of doing this and that, being corrupt, having girlfriends, things like that, is unacceptable and infuriates them and therefore they want them shut down so they send out a order saying, uh, shut them down. And there is a disturbing rumor, which is related, which says that uh, uh, there are factions within the Chinese leadership, and they put out some of these books to make life more difficult for people in the other faction within China. This, of course, is speculation. Another uh, possibility is that there are, at the higher echelons of government, second thoughts on the buildup of the rule of law in China that has been going on since the 1980s. Should we really be doing this is what they may be thinking. And they might be thinking that instead we should be reviving communist and homegrown, traditional, authoritarian spectacles of power, parades, and uh, including these kinds of forced confessions, to reinforce the regime by intimidation and openly reject democracy, as we have heard many times recently. Uh, which also fits with this global turn away from the institutions and the fundamentals of democracy, as I mentioned at the outset. Uh, speaking to the thin skin or infallibility obsession, I noted recently a very strange little incident. There was a speech that the party general secretary made at the G20 meeting in Hangzhou, and he had one of those teleprompters, I believe, that uh, uh, Americans also have. And he was supposed to say, Qing Guan Yi Dao, Tong San Quan Nong. Instead, he said Quan Yi. And this is because these two characters are very similar. Can you see this one and this one? So if this was on the teleprompter, you might miss out and read the wrong one. But of course, one speaks to a more open agricultural trade policy. And the other seems to say, loosen up your clothes or take your clothes off. And therefore, there was an edict that came out. This is being monitored by the ChinaDigitalTimes.net. People leak these uh, censorship edicts so you can read them. And they say right after that, no one can allude to this. No one can discuss it. No one can joke about it. No one can mention it. And if anybody does, it must be immediately deleted from everywhere. And to me, that suggests uh, a thin skin. Because this is uh, misspeaking which to me is not a big deal, but it suggests a certain mindset, which connects to uh, what I said about infallibility. And I see this also in the current uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis the media, which is also new. The top leader made visits to the main state media outlets in this February. And <clears throat> the slogans promoted were that the last name of our television station is the Communist Party. This is a Chinese expression which basically suggests 
a coincidence uh, that we're one and the same. The Communist Party and the TV station is, is one and the same. It's not like TV is, has some kind of independent mission, no. We will be absolutely loyal and we invite you to inspect us. And this is what was happening at this moment. A very strange kind of slogan. Another kind of example among many was the sudden censorship of this book, which seems and not directly related to contemporary affairs because it's about the late 19th century and the first years of the 20th century when the imperial dynasty was overthrown and China tried to move towards a constitutional uh, political organization. Uh, and this book was originally approved. There's a censorship, very harsh censorship. It passed that. It was in all the bookstores being sold. And then suddenly somebody high up must have seen this book and decided that uh, we can't have this. So an order went out to confiscate it and move it off all the shelves and now you cannot buy it anymore. Um, evidently this was a sudden order from somebody higher up overriding this machine. And this again suggests to me uh, an um, uh, individuals high up with the power, in power, taking it upon themselves to make uh, arbitrary decisions as they see fit based on the moment. And that uh, inevitably leads to uh, the suggestion that the same officials doing that must be itching to do the same in Hong Kong and in Taiwan because there is a huge market for publishing in Chinese uh, in those places. And there's a huge demand from mainland visitors who go there and want to buy those books. This is just an example, a former, another uh, general secretary of the Communist Party who is dead uh, since several years uh, uh, had a collection of speeches put out, and uh, that's not available in mainland China either, but you can buy them, as you can see, in Hong Kong. Now, to the question, why this bookstore, Causeway Bay, uh, which has now mysteriously changed ownership, and according to reports, all the books they had have been pulped, and that is destroyed. It could be... Um, the first salvo of a drive to bring censorship to all of Hong Kong. Let's start somewhere. This bookstore will be shut down first. But then there are also these other rumors that suggest it was because of plans, unconfirmed rumor, it was because of plans to publish a book on the former girlfriends of Xi Jinping before his current military singer wife, who is the first lady of China, since he is the president and the general secretary of the Communist Party. The rumors also say that one of these former women uh, in uh, southeast China, in Xiamen, is said to have uh, disappeared from the public eye. You cannot find her, you cannot meet her. Uh, and if true, this would suggest, uh, again, a certain kind of thin-skinnedness, uh, inability to have anybody discuss these things. Uh, and uh, I would say that if Guimenhai was freed, that would be an excellent way of dispelling the impression that uh, China is worried about uh, writings about former girlfriends. And it would also dispel the now widespread impression in the world of thin-skinned disrespect for the freedom of expression and for the rule of law at home and internationally by disrespecting other nation citizens such as ours in Sweden, which I would say un is unworthy of a great nation. You can say in Chinese. Uh, and I would say that damage increases the longer Gui and others are detained. He, his daughter uh, is a really quite um, extraordinary young lady. I think she's 22. And this came very suddenly to her. She was not um, a very public person before that. But now she's taken it upon herself to speak for her father. Here she is at the International publishing association in a meeting in Frankfurt, uh, an association that China had just joined and which has a freedom to publish committee. And she is talking about her father's situation as a publisher. She has also started up a new website that you can go to freeguiminhai.org. And she's also on uh, Facebook doing the same thing. And I have to say that I very much admire her uh, 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 bravery and her um, uh, being so uh, capable and articulate in speaking to all these uh, public audiences about these issues, even though she must be suffering. Uh, I know that she's suffering because I've also spoken to her. Um, 
uh, in the situation that she's in. That's the Causeway Bay uh, bookstore. Now, to widen the perspective, not only these booksellers, but a wide range of other people have been paraded and seen to incriminate themselves on TV uh, outside the law. And this is even though, as I said before, uh, for years, uh, China's government has been saying that we will build up the rule of law, courts, uh, due process, uh, etc., lawyers, and so on. So there's a contradiction here. This particular example that I think was on the publicity, we put on the publicity, is a finance journalist who had written things about where the market was going and then was decided, it was decided by someone somewhere that uh, he caused a crash that happened. So he was told, you better go on TV and confess. It is your fault. And this is him doing that. Another very striking and more directly political example is that of this village leader in Guangdong province, where they had uh, quite famous now elections. And he was elected at the village's representative, uh, partly as an outcome of a struggle over land grabs, which is one of the biggest social issues in rural China right now, where developers seize land, uh, villages protest because they don't want it seized or they want something out of it. And as part of this, he was suddenly disappeared and then showed up uh, on TV saying, I'm corrupt, I accepted bribes, I'm a bad person. They staged a special protest in the streets um, uh, uh, rejecting this uh, um, smearing of their own elected local leader. But of course, as uh, in terms of the dissemination, there is no uh, comparison between what these villages can get out in terms of a message and what the massive uh, media machinery of the uh, state can get out. So this is the image that you, most people will have seen of a corrupt um, village leader who uh, uh, tried to chew over more than he could swallow. And there are many other examples. To me, there's no question that uh, this has become a set pattern uh, that's been picked up from the past. It was not done in recent years, but from about 2013, this mode of grabbing people, working on them, intimidating them, persuading them to present a confession, uh, and then disseminating that on the media uh, has proliferated. So it's become a set choice. And these are just examples that show you that there's a mix of um, entertainers, um, actors, uh, bloggers, uh, journalists, we already mentioned, um, and others who are all caught up in this and on whom this is um, deployed. There's a difference here. And we know that uh, torture is very widely used around China. This is acknowledged by judicial authorities in China also. They, as I will get to, they have issued uh, reminders, declarations that we must stop the torture that is being done by police around China. It, of course, happens mostly to unimportant people, small people, uh, the truck driver or whoever who refuses to confess. He can be beaten. The difference is, of course, that he is not about to be presented on TV. He doesn't have propaganda value. If he had, he might not be beaten so that there would be visible scars. Instead, he would be uh, tortured or intimidated in such a way that he was made to accept his duty, as it were, to confess and uh, not uh, beaten physically. Here's another example <clears throat> of police provided footage, uh, which is, has this strange feature of blurring the face which seems to be a decision by the editors to uh, suggest something like uh, respecting the privacy of the individual being, uh, being put on the spot like this, even as she is put on the spot like this. Um, so this is a curious uh, thing to observe. Uh, there's uh, many other kinds of people who have been uh, put through this, including a lot of uh, lawyers. And during 2015, Hundreds of lawyers representing ordinary people of the kind you saw with a truck driver being tortured or like the villagers uh, being the victims of land grabbing and so on. These lawyers themselves have been rounded up and held incommunicado and forced to 
confess wrongdoing. Uh, some of them were been forced to confess to having colluded with foreigners. Another Swede here. He's one of the foreigners that such lawyers have been accused of colluding with. Because he's a legal aid activist, human rights activist who lived in Beijing for a number of years. He suddenly disappeared and was made to uh, uh, do the same show. He's not the only foreigner that has been put through this. There's been some commercial, some businessmen who have also been put through it. But he was. And uh, he additionally confessed to hurting the feelings of the Chinese people. He uh, waited six months. I was very eager to get his testimony. But it never came. I waited six months, and then finally he gave an interview to a newspaper. I think it was, again, New York Times, where he revealed how people were being tortured and screaming in the uh, room next door. Um, he was not himself tortured, but he was frightened. He was also being intimidated by uh, the authorities telling him that things will happen to your Chinese girlfriend and your Chinese friends if you do not read this statement on TV, which you should, and you will do it. And so he had to rehearse this and, and do this. Uh, in Hong Kong, there's been uh, something of an obsession with observing these um, uh, choreographies, choreographies of these confessions and to spot mistakes that these editors have committed. For example, uh, in the case of my friend, uh, Gui Minhai, they noted, and I don't think that I would have noted this, that midway through the interview, which is presented as if it's one sitting, he is not wearing the same clothes anymore, which of course means that they have been editing this and forgetting to let him wear the same clothes, so it would look like he was there uh, throughout the same, throughout one sitting. It's very interesting to think about uh, what this is about. Is it uh, incompetence? Yes, maybe. Is it arrogance? Maybe these editors are saying to themselves, ah, oh, what the heck, it doesn't matter. Uh, it works anyway. So it's perhaps both. Uh, and I have a slide here where I want to suggest uh, the skeleton outline of how these people, uh, based on these witnesses uh, that we have, testimonies that we have, how uh, these authorities, the people who are doing this, do it. First, you disappear, the victim. You can also do it now from other countries, such as Thailand, Hong Kong. Then you keep things silent. That means there's no communication to relatives, friends, and so on. So everybody is uh, uh, anxious and afraid and scared, both the people held and the people uh, who are connected to them. So I think that's very intentional. Then at the same time, you interrogate and you clean torture the victim. This is a, a specific term that comes from Darius Rejali the prime uh, scholar of um, modern, the history of modern torture, who uses this term to describe, uh, like I was suggesting, torture that doesn't leave obvious scars. Um, and that could be, what could happen is that you could be isolated for lengthy times, you could be informed uh, things that are not true, there could be threats made, and then there could be these various kinds of uh, non-traceable violence, like. Uh, too hot, too cold, uh, no sleep, no food, uh, prolonged standing, uh, and so on and so forth. You can also then move on, as in this case with the booksellers, to detaining associates and then have them speak against each other after they are frightened. But uh, importantly, you assemble a case, and there's a Chinese phrase for this, mo xiu, got to find one. So if it, there isn't anything, you have to uh, find it anyway. And then you script that, and you choreograph it. You practice it in detention until you have uh, a presentation that you're willing to put on TV. You film that. Uh, you yes, you film it first, and you edit it so that it becomes uh, perfect. Then you disseminate this self-incrimination via select mass media. And there's a uh, science on its own uh, as to which channels are used. Uh, you repeat that, you can just appear more uh, people, and then optional. You can then let these people go, or let them sit there, or you can have a trial. You can tell the authorities, the judiciary departments, that now we need a trial. What is also new in these recent years is that you can force uh, Chinese origin people who have uh, foreign citizenship, or who sometimes have dual 
citizenship, as in the case of Li Bo, by the way, to renounce that, um, uh, that and force them to say that. That's something that's new as of last year. Uh, you can also uh, apply the same to foreigners, and especially to less powerful countries such as Sweden or people like that. Uh, if we move beyond uh, this kind of stage confession, I think we see the same kind of choreography in the way uh, people who are apprehended abroad and brought home either for corruption trials, also like here, the people, um, Taiwanese who were taken from Kenya to China. I think that uh, it must be uh, quite intentional, this use of the hoods. I don't know why phone scam detainees would need to be black hooded as if they were Al Qaeda terrorists. But because the Americans do this, it works to do this. And uh, also, not only as a justification because the Americans do it, so we can, uh, but also to suggest that uh, we have complete control over these people. There's no way for them to go. A uh, similar example is the a time in July last year when Thailand um, asked, um, uh, was asked by China to, to give up about, about 100 Uyghur people who had gotten to Thailand to ask for asylum status and to be shipped away from there, uh, but who were sent back to China. And uh, this was put on uh, Chinese television, apparently causing a protest from Thai authorities. Who, who the military junta authorities who were saying that uh, this was not part of the deal. Um, we gave you the prisoners, but don't make this kind of show of them because that reflects badly on Thailand, is, is what one kind of news says. And when we look at these uh, um, presentations on TV, uh, we can begin to see influence, other kinds of influences. Uh, I mentioned the American black hoods. I think that's an imported technique that uh, has been picked up. Uh, this one, uh, we, can, we can see how uh, they've picked up something else, which is these bars, which is also not a traditional Chinese way of doing things. This one, I think, is picked up from elsewhere, from Russia. Because in Russia, uh, this has been used uh, for quite a long time. When you have suspects in court, you put them in a cage with this kind of see-through bars to uh, highlight the fact that these people are uh, subjected to accusations. They're not only suspects, but uh, likely criminals. So it's very much a stage show. This is just happens to be one of the business tycoons, but this has happened to a lot of people there. And uh, my theory is that uh, when the editors, the choreographers of these uh, confessions in China uh, work, they gather ideas from elsewhere, such as from the US, such as from, from Russia. There is a longer uh, history of uh, drawing on the Russian examples that goes back to the Soviet Union. And I want to move now into uh, historical uh, um, origins of these practices uh, as they play out in, in China now. Um, right now, we have uh, not just um, people like booksellers and journalists and people who are not Communist Party officials, but ordinary citizens in China. I've, so far, I've spoken most about them. But we also have, as part of the anti-corruption campaign in China, many officials who have put through the same motions. Uh, and um, I would say that um, the way they are presented, um, uh, the way they are uh, made to seem contrite and confess various kinds of crimes, has very strong parallels to the way these other people are um, treated. So there's a, there's a family of these phenomena. But this, uh, are, these are communists. These are members of the ruling parties. This is members of the elite. This is the elite treating uh, themselves, their own people, to this. And uh, th so this is uh, different in that regard. I think that um, uh, one very interesting example was one of the highest ranking communist uh, officers in China ever since 1949 to be accused like this, uh, or at least in recent decades was Zhou Yunkang, and it's very interesting to see how he was kept in house arrest for 10 months. Of course, he wasn't given any hair coloring, so he lost the shining black hair that Chinese leading officials always seem to have, even though they are 70 years old. And he reverted back to his uh, white hair. Then he was put on trial. And I have a theory, this is speculation, but uh, my theory is that uh, this is intentional and a part of the um, uh, choreography to make the, uh, the people put on the spot look uh, defensive and um, worn out and um, um, 
and not able to uh, defend themselves, but instead confessing. Of course, in the case of these most high-ranking officials, they uh, would hold their confessions short, but submitting to this procedure is, of course, already to, play, to be playing along. And for this, I think we have to go to the original Soviet communist model of Lenin's and Stalin show trials uh, to see the origins of this. Uh, this, this was also exactly um, um, sham uh, show trials um, involving uh, former members of the same communist elite that was ruling the country after the revolution. Many people think that Stalin started this, but actually it was Lenin. Uh, I've been studying a bit, uh, studying up a bit on this. It was the founder of the KGB uh, and Lenin, the two of them together, who decided in 1922 that we're going to make this upcoming trial of our enemies into a show trial. We are instructing the judges to not look at their books. Instead, accept a preordained verdict that they will make. Uh, and we will ask the media to work together and propagate this as, um, uh, as an educative exercise. This is the essence of the show trial, and it's exactly what you have in the Chinese examples, and which we haven't seen for a while, but now has been picked up again. This is uh, one of Lenin's closest associates, a very interesting uh, affair. Uh, he was executed by Stalin uh, and as, as, uh, because he was a competitor for, for power. The, what is interesting about it is that um, Many people in the past have thought that um, he was just such a firebrand communist that he decided, I have to confess publicly, otherwise I will shame my party. I will bring, uh, um, uh, my, my communist party would look bad. And therefore he put up with it. But there's been recent historical research by witnesses who were part of these proceedings who have instead told the true story, which is that uh, he was told that he had to uh, confess and that his entire family would be executed including his children, and he desperately tried to uh, negotiate for the life of his children and for himself, uh, but to no use because they were all killed by Stalin. But this was why, uh, at one moment, he made this uh, confession that stunned the world. He confessed to plotting to murder Stalin and to, to uh, secretly plot with his enemies and so on, which was all complete nonsense, of course. And the Chinese communists picked up this uh, very early on. This is uh, from 1952, supposedly the first show trial of corrupt officials, communist elite members. And uh, you can see that it's already taking on uh, the you know, Chinese characteristics that uh, we saw a lot during the Mao era. This kind of uh, labeling of the victims, putting their, uh, uh, the accusation against them alongside with their name uh, on their bodies and so on. This was... Um, developed further in the Cultural Revolution uh, when it sometimes turned into on-the-spot lynching. There were people who were killed on the spot when this was happening. This was during Mao's uh, uh, Cultural Revolution. And it is, of course, because of those excesses that since the 1980s, after the death of Mao Zedong, many people in China have felt that we need the rule of law, we need a judiciary system, we need courts, we need this due process, we need all these things. And as such a system has been partly built up. There is a large infrastructure with courts at different levels and so on. This is the Supreme Court of China. Uh, and what is very interesting to me is that in recent years, the Supreme Court, as well as other uh, levels, have explicitly condemned uh, staged confessions and explicitly condemned the torture, which they acknowledge that it exists. Uh, but they come out against it. It is illegal. The laws that have been implemented since 1980 say it's illegal. You cannot do this. Uh, but it is being done. So they, being invested in this process of building up a judiciary system, they try to put their word in for stopping it. Just a snapshot from the Supreme Court's uh, uh, web page. These are the kinds of people who are thinking these thoughts that China needs the rule of law. This is why we're here. This is what we are trying to do. We are not stooges. And recently there was a very interesting pronouncement by a, a top judge of a provincial court who was asked by the Wall Street Journal, what do you think about these TV confessions? Well, he said, outside of a court, no one has the right to decide whether someone is guilty of a crime. The police aren't qualified. 
Prosecutors aren't qualified. Media are less qualified to determine guilt. That's a direct reference to CCTV, the China State Evolution, putting people on show and confessing to crimes that they haven't even been accused of yet. So this is a powerful statement, and it shows you what I think is a very powerful sentiment, not just among the judiciary, but probably among many people in China, that this is the wrong way to go. Another example is the vice chair of the China Lawyers Association, uh, not being interviewed by Westerners, but saying in a Beijing newspaper, this article was still up as of yesterday. So this can be said somehow. Forcing people to confess on TV means saddling them with a presumption of guilt. That's illegal. All evidence needs to be presented in court. All arguments need to be made in court. And the final judgment should be based on the court's investigation, not somebody else's investigation. That's very powerful. So uh, we see that there's this split. There are these contending trends. And uh, we don't know where they will go. Let's ask, step even further back and ask, where do these torture practices come from? And in my research, what I found is surprising to me is that I don't think they build a lot on precedents from China's own traditions of torture, which have been prevalent, of course. You know that uh, yeah, there's a whole literature about uh, deaths by a thousand cuts linked to, and so on and so forth. And there was, of course, a lot of uh, punitive uh, display of uh, those sentenced in imperial China like this but uh, not spectacle staged as if voluntary. They didn't do that. And in that sense, they're more like the Nazis than the Soviets, I mean, traditional China. Because the Nazis also, it's very interesting to think about, they never put these shows on. And I have a theory about why the difference, but we can get to that. What I'm saying is that uh, the source uh, for the clean torture, no touch torture that we see involved in the production of these forced confessions doesn't necessarily come from traditional China. Bad as you know, the judicial system may have been in some respects with torture and everything in traditional China. If you read Darius Rejali, you'll find out, this is probably the best book today about the history of modern torture methods. Uh, you'll learn that at clean torture, this set of practices that don't leave scars, are a modern invention by Western European police forces spurred on by the urge to have uh, clean statistics, to satisfy bureaucratic uh, requirements. We want a high conviction rate. We want to be an efficient police force. And uh, that would mean uh, more public support for police as fit in a democracy. And uh, that would mean better relations with the uh, politicians who speak for law and order if the police is efficient. There's, um, we had a talk recently in Anthropology by Lawrence Roth on the black box of police torture, the history in Chicago of Chicago police officers in cahoots with politicians implementing torture they'd learned in the war in Vietnam on um, people in Chicago and covering it up. And it was, uh, it is something that is also discussed by Darius Rajali in his book. Uh, this is where it came from. So, it came from Western democracies, even though, of course, in reality, these practices are subverting the very fundamentals of democracy, equality before the law. How can you have that? Presumed innocence. Those are key elements. Uh, and there's a tension within our democracies uh, because of this. And it's because these practices are useful, clean torture practices are useful, that they were picked up I uh, wrote uh, Darius Rajali, and we had a long conversation on email. And it is not something that uh, he has studied, but uh, he is venturing that there might have been Soviet communist prisoners in Europe who learned about and saw the practices of European police forces. And then, after they gained power in the Soviet Union, they perfected this. Uh, in the contemporary US, the most striking example may be uh, right here in New York is the Central Park Five. These are five men intimidated in confessing to a 1989 crime. They were then exonerated completely by a due process that said they didn't do it. Somebody else did it. There's proof somebody else did it. Uh, there's a screenshot. And this is what they look like today. And it's before the current uh, president-elect uh, began arguing that, no, they're guilty. This worries me a lot. That's authoritarianism. That's setting aside. That's what I meant by rejecting and setting aside 
democracy is the key element, uh, which worries me a lot. Uh, this is a part and parcel of the same issue, whether we are in China or in the US. Um, if we think ahead, this is a side track, perhaps a futuristic. Uh, recent research are, um, is showing that the kind of hard work that the um, uh, police were doing on the Central Park Five, convincing them by intimidation over lengthy periods of time uh, that they were guilty, that they did it, changing their own mental pictures of themselves and their memory of their actions inside of their head. This is extremely traumatic for them. All of that work may no longer be necessary in the future because there are new techniques developed for how to alter the memories of uh, living things. They're doing it for rats very success successfully. And you can see this movie to learn about the Harvard researchers who are saying this is uh, the bright future of taking away our phobias uh, so that we don't remember the scary incidents that cause us to be afraid of spiders or things like that. And of course, what authoritarian regimes will do with this is to alter your memory so that uh, you now remember that you either did it or didn't, depending on what they want you to say, and so that you can then repeat it, which is a scary prospect, but perhaps worthy of a talk on its own. Again, I do want to make the point that this basic issue of modern police forces seeking bureaucratic uh, um, success, efficiency, is, is uh, shared between China and uh, other countries. In China, it's worse. Of course, you have 100%. Who would believe that? But they are aware that this uh, problem exists, uh, perhaps because of this. People in the ju judiciary know that, no, those people are not, those 100% people are not guilty. Some of those will be innocent people who have been tortured and forced to confess by the police, as in this picture. Now, this is a little off, of course, because not everyone is beaten with a stick like that. But you get the picture. The policeman is looking to his bureaucratic superiors who are asking him for statistics. Can you show us a high conviction rate? That's what he's doing. So that's why he's telling the victim, confess or else. So China shares in a global modern predicament of justice. But we should still ask, what is uh, historically specific to communist China and the Soviet case? So I already told you this was imported from the Soviet Union. It was perfected for the special purpose of coercing political prisoners. Assigned parts in propaganda spectacles showcasing the power of the regime and disseminated via mass media and now social media so as to warn and frighten the wider public, which is rules, by reference to an, uh, this is specific to, I think, to Soviet and the Chinese communism, to an official teleology that claims ownership of the truth, how history should unfold uh, with the self appointed Communist Party in charge, which, which is different from other kinds of authoritarian regimes, such as the fascist ones or other varieties. And I won't get into, but I think it's very interesting to think about how this uh, also helps explain the theocratic character of um, uh, China and uh, what was the Soviet Union, in the sense that the Communist Party is the same as the Vatican. It is the, the holder of the truth about uh, history and uh, humankind and uh, the ultimate authority uh, over the executive branch. Um, but before I end, I want to ask also another kind of question that I think should be asked, and which is very interesting. Is there also, at the same time, some kind of shared Confucian character to this Chinese authoritarianism? Perhaps shared with other parts of East Asia, which are much more democratic politically, Japan, Korea. But they also have these crazy conviction rates. This is an example, just three slides about that. Uh, in Korea, there was a pop band that included a Taiwanese uh, girl, singer. And they were all in uh, bunk beds waving their flag. You, some of you saw this video, maybe. And then because she waved a Taiwanese flag, see, she's waving Korean and Taiwanese flags. Uh, she was contacted by, her, by the business uh, owners of the, this show saying that this could mean bad business in China because you're not allowed to show the flag of Taiwan. So she came on air to affirm uh, that she was um, uh, proud to be Chinese, et cetera, et cetera. And what is interesting here was that uh, a huge number of people in, you know, on social media in Taiwan, they saw the direct parallel to ISIS videos where they filmed the guy digging his own grave just before his head is cut off. 
uh, they thought that uh, this treatment of this young lady and her fearful demeanor as she was presenting this uh, was suggestive of this. And of course, there is a parallel. This is about uh, power inequality. If you go to Japan, you can see public apologies that seem very similar in form to the Chinese uh, communist version that we see today. But it's, sometimes they seem um, overdone. Uh, this guy is a member of parliament who cried so much that it became a, a national joke and went all around the internet as something to mock and ridicule, which of course cannot happen in China. There is also a difference that he would not be in prison. He's not being told to this. He's just out to try a trick to save his political future, his seat in parliament and things like that. But it is very interesting to uh, compare and to think about how there is a certain underlying shared notion of um, uh, respect for authority, this kind of thing that's played up in the Asian values discourses that we find. Um, and um, I think so also because you can see in Japan, uh, as in China, something that's slightly different but also has a kind of family resemblance of what happens in China, uh, the um, a confession of something bad a self-mutilation here, cutting off her beautiful hair, a member uh, of a girl's band who's uh, had a boyfriend, even though she's not supposed to have a boyfriend, they have their own rules and the public uh, expects them to, uh, to hold them. But I think it is of a family in that it means submission to authority, it means uh, submission of yourself to a collective, uh, uh, instead of arguing, um, go away, I have the right to see my boyfriend. I wanted to end by going to Franz Kafka. His most famous book that is relevant for us is uh, The Trial. This is uh, Orson Welles' um, film version of it. Um, it was posthumously, posthumously published. It's a story that's very relevant to us here. It's the story of a man, uh, named only by the initial K, who is abruptly made to realize that he's being presumed guilty for some crime, and he's expected to conform to the opaque procedures of a court process, which ends after about a year, of his futile demands to find out what the concrete charges are, which he's never told. And it ends with his execution, uh, with two men killing him by sticking a knife in its heart, uh, an execution to which he submits almost voluntarily, even if he seems still to be hesitating and hoping that there might be some kind of last recourse. Many commentaries have uh, described Kafka as the author that talks about anguish of the lonely individual of modern society. But I think that's not enough. Um, Kafka himself at one point insisted, I am Chinese. And this is an argument that cannot really be reconciled with describing him only as the author of Western, describing, analyzing Western modernity. There's something deeper, and I should like to argue. And here I'm reading along with Hannah Arendt in her 1944 reinterpretation of Kafka. Um, that his writings are about uh, systematic inequality, uh, the antithesis of democracy in, terms, in the terms that I used earlier, in terms of the equality before the law. I think that Kafka's writings serve to expose the ideology that naturalizes unequal authority, uh, the ideology which supports us as a system. Uh, and he exposes how that ideology colonizes the minds of, all, of almost every member of the society they're in, so that this state of affairs of inequality becomes invisible to them with consequences for everyone. There is a story by Kafka called The Building of the Chinese Great Wall, which shows a China characterized precisely by such a system of inequality. There are the lowly wall builders uh, that are never given any explanation of why the wall is being built, why they have to build it the way they do. They are expected to just assume that the emperor knows and that uh, and the emperor's arbitrary power is warranted on this assumption that he knows and they don't. They have no say. So as in the society of the trial, everyone in this fictional China accepts this state of affairs as a given, a natural state of affairs which cannot even be addressed because it can't be seen. But of course, by writing it, Kafka is exposing it for what it is. And Hannah Arendt writes um, on the trial, no man can expect justice from judicial procedures where interpretation of the law is coupled with the administering of lawlessness. That is lawlessness in the sense of the arbitrary framing and intimidation of a man made a suspect for the purpose of serving as a suspect. 
The bureaucrats who conduct this process argues are, are functionaries of and faithful believers in an imagined necessity, which, she argues, was an ideological formulation prevalent in Kafka's own time. The idea that we are subjected to a grand, necessary, and automatic process to which we must submit. We can't do anything about it. Um, and to which most people unquestioningly do submit themselves. I think China today is an example of this, and we may become an example of this. I would argue that Kafka's tale served to expose the ruse behind this, and that his genius lies in his simplistic seeming depiction, frighteningly accurate, of how we all, if left alone like K in the story of the trial, in the face of this system, would succumb to the dictates of the torturers, even before the torture starts, as with K in the trial. Kafka was very keen on considering torture and the threat of torture as the means of enforcing conformity. Faced with the threat of such intimidation, we all might easily become confused. And like Kay, in the face of massive conformity all around us, we would choose, quote unquote, to conform as well by accepting the assigned guilt, like all those victims of no-touch torture, uh, clean torture, and staged confessions that I have spoken about today, uh, which I think could all be us. And indeed, I think we could be next. So that's why I believe we must take uh, Kafka's prophecies uh, very seriously. That's why this is not the end. Uh, our future depends on our continued vigilance. And as scholars, research, analysis, critique. But thanks for now. <laughs>